Welcome to the Arefco Service Group YouTube channel. Please remember to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello, I'm Mark and this is the second video in our series on evaluating a refrigerant charge. Using the subcooling method should only be done on systems with a TXV valve before the evaporator. With TXV systems, the metering device works to keep the proper amount of refrigerant in the evaporator at all times and a reasonably constant superheat. To simplify my description of subcooling, I'll use the air conditioning mode as an example. As you know, when the liquid refrigerant in the evaporator absorbs the heat from the indoor air, it boils off to a vapor. This refrigerant gas is pulled out of the evaporator, taking the heat energy that is absorbed with it. The compressor compresses the refrigerant into a high pressure gas which increases its temperature at the same time. This high temperature, high pressure gas enters the condenser and begins dissipating the heat into the outdoor air. In this system we have the compressor, the condenser, a metering device which is a TXV metering device and an evaporator. The outdoor air is 95 degrees. So let's take a look at our worksheet and we'll go from there. So we have a SEER 13 unit using R410A refrigerant. The metering device is a TXV. We're not going to worry about our return air wet bulb or relative humidity. For our purposes for what we're doing now that's that's not important but I have entered those numbers. Our outdoor temperature is 95 degrees our required condenser temperature difference is 15 degrees. That equals our required condenser saturation temp of 110. Our required subcooling is 10 as well. So that's, those are the numbers we're starting with for this exercise. So going back to our system here, if things are working perfectly, the temperature of the refrigerant entering the condenser is 110 degrees, which means it's at 365 psi. And as it travels down through the condenser to the black line, it remains 110 degrees. But it's dissipating heat, which is condensing the refrigerant, and it's giving off that heat to the air passing through the condenser. Once it hits that black line, it's now all liquid. There's no vapor left. And from there to the bottom of the condenser, it will continue to give off heat and it gives off sensible heat. This liquid stacks up in the bottom of the condenser, waiting to exit the condenser and return to the evaporator via the liquid line. There must be liquid in the liquid line or the system will not function. If there is any gas in the liquid line, the system will behave as if it's restricted and the evaporator will be starved of refrigerant. Having the proper amount of liquid stacked up in the bottom of the condenser is critical because as the load increases on the air conditioning system, the amount of liquid required in the evaporator increases. The liquid stored in the condenser supplies the increase in liquid needed for the evaporator to operate properly and prevents the condenser from running out of liquid refrigerant at high load conditions. Subcooling is a measurement of how much the liquid in the condenser cools down below its saturation point before exiting. When the hot gas in the condenser first turns to liquid, its temperature is at its saturation point. This means that the temperature of the liquid is at the same temperature at which the refrigerant is condensing. It does that above the line. Once it gets below the line, then it starts to give off additional heat in the form of sensible heat. So between the black line and the bottom of the condenser, it will give off another 10 degrees of subcooling and it will exit the condenser at 100 degrees. Thus, we have 10 degrees of subcooling. So let's go back to our worksheet. Our head pressure is 365 psi. We convert that using a pressure temperature chart, a condenser saturation temperature of 110. From that we subtract 100 which was the actual temperature, line temperature of the refrigerant and that equals 
10 degrees of subcooling. But what if these are the pressures we got? We were reading 340 psi. Our actual liquid line temperature was 100. What kind of numbers are we looking at now? Well, if we convert 340 psi using our pressure temperature chart, it converts to 105 degrees condenser saturation temperature. We subtract the 100 from that, and that gives us 5 degrees of subcooling. Well, we know a couple of things here. We know that our head pressure is low. Up above, there are required condenser saturation temperature should be 110, but it's actually 105. And since the condenser saturation temperature is low, head pressure is low as well. So that's indication number one. Indication number two is we have low subcooling. We only have five degrees of subcooling and we should have 10. Those two things are going to tell us that we have a low level of refrigerant in our condenser. But what if it goes the other way? What if we have too much refrigerant in the uh, condenser? and the system is overcharged. What will our numbers look like then? Here's a hypothetical of 415 psi which converts to 120 degrees saturation temperature. We measure our liquid line temperature and it's 103 degrees and that means we have 17 degrees of subcooling. Going back to our chart here let's enter a few numbers and see where we're at. So we've got 416 psi and that gives us a condenser saturation temperature of 120. When we measured the actual liquid line temperature it was 103. That gives us a subcooling of 17 degrees. Our required subcooling is 10 degrees so we have high subcooling. So the high head pressure of 416 psi and the high subcooling tells us we have an overcharged system and some refrigerant needs to be taken out. By using our form here and looking at our subcooling on a TXV system we can tell whether we have too much refrigerant in the system, not enough refrigerant, or just the right amount of refrigerant. If it's a fixed orifice metering device then we're going to be looking at our superheat. But on a TXV unit, we're going to use subcooling. <laughs>